Dr. Ian Mudway from the NRC HPA Centre for Environment and Health at King's College London. And uh, you can tell us about why evolution is bad for human health. Okay, I have slides, so you'll have to excuse me. I have probably far too many of them. And it's going to be a little bit London centric too, maybe a bit of the states and, and the world issues as well. I, I want to give you a background, a kind of historical context. I know you've probably heard much of the historical context before about the smogs and how we discovered the fine particles were potentially damaging to health. But I think it's important because many of the lessons, many of the key features which came out of the original studies of the smogs in the 1950s are still with us in terms of who dies, what they die of who the sensitive individuals are. And so it's pertinent to review those before we go on to talk about what London is like at the current time. So, I'm going to start off with the London smog. This is obviously quite famous. We know clearly that during the period in early December when we have to build up a black smoke and sulfur dioxide, thousands of additional people die. When you think of this as being black smoke, but I wanted to make one point about this, which is you think about black smoke and we think now about PM10 and 2.5. And the assumption is this is really large carbonaceous material in the air. If you take autopsy samples of lungs from people who died during the smog in 1952, and you look at them microscopically, the particles you can see in the embedded lung tissues are micrometer-sized particles. So this episode wasn't just large carbonaceous material from sulfurous coal, it also had PM10 in it, it had a lot of PM2.5 in it. A lot of the PM contained metal species, and you can actually see them accumulating in the lung sections of people who died in 1952, and around those accumulations of particles, you can see massive inflammation in the lungs and tissue injury. So the actual pathology exists to say the particles were causing inflammation and tissue injury in these individuals. And the next slide is simply an illustration of the number of people who died in the concentration, so I'll go past that. Because I wanted to just, if I can, go to this, which is the question of who died. And this is still a pertinent question. Clearly the story, the sort of anecdotal reporting which goes on with 1952, tells you the people who died with the elderly with pre-existing cardiovascular and pulmonary conditions. In fact, many of the people who died died of bronchitis, and certainly symptomatically bronchitis was the major thing people were turning up in the hospitals and complaining of. But this looks at the ratios of people who died in the week before and the week after the episode, stratified by age. And I just wanted to put this up because it makes a simple point. Yes, there was a doubling, almost a threefold increase in mortality rate in the elderly and the elderly are sensitive group. One of the things which happens to us is we enter the third quarter, third, if you like, portion of our life, second fast, you know, 50, 60, 70, is that we get less good at dealing with stresses. We become more sensitive. When we're young, we can tolerate a lot of stresses in the environment. That's why people who are young can smoke. People who are older begin to see symptomatic responses because their bodies get worse at defending themselves. The inflammation doesn't die down after they've smoked. The capacity of their cells to repair decreases. So that final if you like, third of life. It's a critical period. We are more sensitive as individuals. But the thing which is highlighted here is this. It's very often not stated about the 52 smogs. The, the children under 12 months were the other group of individuals where there was an increased mortality rate. So we're looking at the very, very young and the old. And back in 1952, we already had identified the elderly and the young were at increased risk of premature mortality. And the problem about all of this, of course, is that we have this obsession, and it's probably a dangerous obsession, I think we mentioned it, with the headline figure of mortality. Because mortality is, if you like, the pinnacle of the health pyramid. It's as bad as it's going to get. We also have to consider the other aspects which affect larger proportions of the population. So if we have a small number of people who are dying because of an episode, Underpinning that, we have an increased number of people who suffer worsening of the symptoms of the pre-existing diseases that they have. They may have to have hospital admissions, they may have to have increased medications. We may see increased doctor visits. We may see people with conditions such as asthma having more attacks, requiring more medication. That's a larger proportion of the population. And then right down here is the really critical one. Because I can guarantee, having come in on the tube today, that my lungs are inflamed. I can guarantee it because I know what the science is behind it. We, as we move through the city, will be suffering from sub, what we call sub 
clinical effects in our lungs. There will be some inflammation. We'll have some small changes in our lung function. And they're sort of subclinical in most of us, especially in the adult population. They're not necessarily aware they're there. But the presence of them occurring daily, over years, is the irritation within the lung which causes, if you like, you refer to it as a life shortening. Another way of looking at it is a premature aging of the respiratory system, a premature aging of the cardiovascular system, which makes you, if you like, more susceptible to an earlier death later in life. So this down here, these effects which affect millions of people, should not be forgotten when we start talking about the years of lost life at the top of this pyramid. Both are important. And to illustrate that again, we don't have to go back too far. 1952, again, hospital admissions, forget the 4,000 people who died, hospital admissions across London increased by 50%. Again, respiratory admissions increased by 160%. So, the quality of life of the residents in these air pollution episodes is also critical, as well as the economic loss of output from people who aren't working, people who are absent from schools, people who are absent from the workplace. Clearly, we always say London smog is resolved in air acts, and then the nature of air pollution changed as we had increasing traffic. I'll just make the point, there are still places in the world which has air pollution which is completely comparable to the 1952 smogs. You go to the developing world, if you go to India, if you go to some of those some, you know, countries in South America, the same conditions pertain as pertained in 1952. So whilst in the UK we can say many of these pollutants went down, it's not a worldwide phenomenon, so globally you can't ignore the fact that many people still live in conditions like the London population used to experience. The reason I wanted to highlight traffic is I wanted to take you through again some important data which led us to believe that the fine particles in traffic had a health effect. And so I'm going to review very quickly the data from the Six City study. And I think it's really important because it's often quoted, but people haven't really gone through the paper carefully to understand exactly what that paper is actually talking about. So I thought I'd do that for you, so you could see where this data came from and what it actually looks like and how robust it is. So the Six City Study, well the paper was published, it's a landmark paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1993, looked at mortality. It also looked at morbidity, hospital beds, but it looked at mortality predominantly in six communities within the United, King, within the United States from the mid-70s until the late 80s. Across here we have the concentrations of different types of pollutions which, was met, which were measured over that extended period. So this is sort of like a 16 year average. Okay? So you have Sturmenville and St. Louis, which are very industrialized areas. You can see they have high levels of particles, total particles, fine particles, PM 2.5, 2.5 microns, and sulfate particles. And right at the bottom you have Topeka and Portage, which are relatively clean. Rural, which is like cities, if you like. And you can see the concentrations are much lower. So in this study, what they looked at was the probability of dying over that 16-year period. And so what I'm going to show you next is a probability curve. How likely were you to die over that period for each of these cities? And this is the first bit of the data which isn't shown. And what we're looking at here is your probability of surviving for the population within each of those cities. And right at the top, I can actually indicate this to make it easier for you. These are the cleanest cities. Your these are the dirty cities, student versus Louis. Your probability of survival is way down here, compared with the cleaner cities. Um, <coughs> so you try to animate these things, it goes all the way. Whereas if you go to the polluted cities, you can see the difference. The chances of dying prematurely are much higher in the industrial cities and states over this period than in the more rural locations. And what they did from that is they then looked at your odds of dying in relation to the pollution over those cities over the period of time. And that's where these famous graphs come from. There is no more famous graph in air pollution than this one. Okay? And the reason this is so important is when you do science on large populations, nothing ever falls on a nice and simple straight line. Yeah? What you get is a cloud of data and somebody might be standing in front of you saying there's a pattern in this cloud of data and you all sit there and go, I can't see it, to be quite honest, I'll take your word for it. But this is amazing because here we have, let's look at the fine particles, here we have portage, here we have the increased chance. So what they've said is 
this is your chance of dying in portage over that period. We're going to set that as a value of 1. What's your increased percentage chance of dying in the other locations? And you can see it's 30%, about 30% more likely to die prematurely in Sturbanville, the polluted environment, than in portage. And look at this linear relationship. It's absolutely phenomenal. This was really the study which made people take note of the fine particles, which led to the interest in traffic and the impact of traffic on people's health. Initially, this was really thinking about industrial emissions, but it didn't take long to go from PM2.5 to traffic particles. The other thing about this finding is it's incredibly robust. Wherever you look for this association, you find this association. The magnitude of the association may differ between different places, but the association exists between mortality and exposure to fine particles, to NO2. And the NO2 data is really interesting. Now, I know many of us in this room are interested in NO2. NO2 is a huge challenge for us. Yeah? Because when you look at it in terms of toxicology, you would say it's not toxic at the levels we breathe. But when you look at the population epidemiology, there's clear evidence that people are dying prematurely from NO2 but concentrations currently below the WHO guideline of levels. And there's this mismatch between what I'm going to talk about later on the science and humans, experimental science, and what actually goes on in the real world, which means there are things we don't understand about NO2, which we still need to think about. People who die, this is interesting, the people we're dying of COPD, bronchitis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. COPD is a disease, I always find, I, I study COPD. So the general population ignorance about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which very shortly will become the third largest killer of people in the world, okay, in the next 10 years. But people don't know about that, and they focus on cardiovascular and cancer risk is amazing. But COPD, patients, patients with bronchitis or emphysema, who are the ones who are dying prematurely. Pneumonia was highlighted, though it wasn't significant, and here we have cardiovascular disease. So these are the individuals who seem to be dying prematurely in these cities. Having said that, that's the setting scene. We talk, you were talking about your report and you know, the exceedances of NO2. My children go to um, Haberdashers in central London. I live in Ucross. So every morning I have to walk from up that hill. And from that hill every morning, I can look down across the whole of London. Now this isn't my picture. Somebody sent this to our blog um, in October of last year. And you can see the city. There's the real lake. It just says this. There's the you can see the inversion layer of NO2 sitting over the whole city. And I see this inversion layer, I see it every single day, unless it's raining. Every time I drop my children off, I look over down the hill, and you can see London bathed in this ocean of ground nitrogen dioxide. So to a certain extent, for me, it's actually much more physically visible than just actually relying on the measurements from the actual traffic sites. We are living within a traffic-derived soup. The problem is, and I do a lot of education for children, is how you convince them of them that, when actually as they walk down the street they can perceive nothing. They can't see the brown gases, they can't see the particles in the air. But this is just to say, look, it's here. You don't have to imagine it. Take people who don't believe you up a hill in London on a clear day and make them look down at the city. It's the most arresting physical demonstration you can give them of the air quality issues London faces. I. I'm an experimental science, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a modeler, okay? I like to see what happens when people are breathing pollution. And some of the experiments I've done, okay, may sound a bit strange. But what I do is I work with colleagues in Sweden and we expose individuals to pollution. Now we do it in northern Sweden, a place called Mio, big university town, but way, way north. You know, it's like a one and a half hour flight north of Stockholm. The air there is incredibly clean which means we can take these individuals and expose them to the levels of diesel they would experience walking down the road in central London, and then we can see what that does to their airways. In a way you couldn't do in London, because by the time we took you to a chamber in London, you probably already would have breathed that concentration, so we wouldn't see any effects over the blood in the So what we have here, this is a happy Scandinavian medical student in a box, on an exercise bicycle, doing some exercise, and over here, behind this wall, here we have a lovely Volvo diesel engine, <laughs> producing diesel. And then that gets shunted through here. This is a big tube, 
And we dilute the diesel exhaust, of course, because it's not like it's not like an animal study. We're seeing how many have got the doses to kill people. So we, we dilute it and we feed it into this chamber. And the concentrations, we've done a range of concentrations, but a lot of our work's been done at 300, which is quite high. Although if you walk down a busy road in London, as a, as a personal exposure, you can attain that. And 100 micrograms per meter cube. These people are exercising, but there they are, they're being exposed. So what happens when you're breathing diesel exhaust? And this diesel exhaust is PM. Actually, it's ultra-fine PM. Because the particles come from the diesel engine in these exposures are about 30 to 80 nanometers. So very, very fine particles, a lot of carbonaceous material, but also a big slug of NO2. So it's kind of a co-exposure. And what I wanted to show to you was these concentrations have a real effect in your lungs. And that's important because otherwise you can align the health effects, people reporting populations, to what you're really breathing. So here's a picture of the lung. Okay? So here we have our conducting airways. I've got the alveolar areas down here. And what we do is we expose them, and if that wasn't bad enough, then we take them into the clinic, we perform bronchoscopy on them, which means we pass a tube, fiber optic tube, into their lung, usually down into the first branch, second branch, third or fourth branch of the airways. And then we kind of wash the surface of the airway. We can bring some liquid back, which tells us what's on the surface of the airway. Or it's got a little hole in it with a claw, so we can come down and we can pull a piece of the tissue out. Okay? This does not hurt because you have no pain receptors in your lungs. And I have had this done on myself. The only strange sensation is you can feel your lungs moving and your chest cavity is a bit <laughs> Anyway, so we've taken out a piece of tissue, we've fixed it in a resin block and we've sliced it very, very thinly, and now we can see what's happening in that tissue. So the individuals we expose them twice, once to very clean air and once to our diesel exhaust. What you're looking at here, this is the sort of like the surface of the airway and underneath you have this sort of like, it's called the submucosa, it's kind of like a tissue matrix which the cells stick to on the lung. And what we've done is we've stained certain cells within this tissue section and these cells are neutrophils. Now neutrophils I always regard as being like the infantry of the immune system, okay? They are recruited when there's injury, they're packed full of dangerous cytotoxic materials to kill bacteria. So you don't really want huge amounts of neutrophils moving into a tissue without there being an appropriate stimuli. What we can see is in air, you have a few of these brown spots which are <coughs> neutrophils, and after they've been exposed to diesel, you have a lot more. So there's a huge inflammation in the airway which occurs acutely after these individuals have been exposed to diesel. And we see this even at 100 micrograms per meter cube. So inflammation is occurring. And when inflammation occurs, you get tissue injury, and when you get tissue injury, then you begin to have structural changes occurring in the lung. Now the next thing is just how the data looks when you put it into paper, it's much less interesting. But what you can see over here, this is the epithelium of the lung, which is this bit. This is sudden mucosa. And what you're looking at is this is out air, this is diesel. You see most of the lines going up, which means most of these individuals have more neutrophils in their airway after they've been exposed to diesel. And then this is a really interesting one down here. You can't really see it. But this is in blood, which means the inflammation after they had breathed the diesel was not simply restricted to their lungs. It was affecting the whole cardiovascular system. They had inflammation systemically. So, again, this is important because we know that many of the people who die when they're exposed to NO2 PM seem to be dying of worsenings of their cardiovascular conditions. So, as context, the pollution does something. It really causes harmful changes to the airways, which you can see experimentally without any confounding or anything you can't understand. Of course, that's a chamber. Now, this is a study which was done by colleagues at Imperial, and this is kind of a real-world equivalent, because the pollution in the global is different. In fact, it's very difficult to pin down exactly what it is all of the time, because it's very, very complicated. But here, a study was done in asthmatics, but they made use of the fact that Oxford Street was a diesel-only thoroughfare, and they walked the asthmatics up and down this road. They also got the asthmatics to walk around the round pond in Hyde Park. And there are differences in the concentrations of pollutants. So if we look at some of the concentrations here, in Hyde Park, PM10 is about 72 micrograms per meter cube, PM2.5 11.2. If we go over here, PM10 and Oxford Street is 125, 28. So 125 micrograms, that's more than my human challenge does at 100 where we show the information. And what they were able to show in this study is when they looked at the asthmatics, they actually could see physiologic changes. 
So here, they're looking at a measurement of lung function. How much air you can put out of your lungs in a one second maneuver. Tells you something about the compliance of the areas. And we can see here is oxygen, this is high pump. This is what happens as they walk along oxygen street. They have this loss of lung function, and it doesn't actually recover up to seven hours after the end of that walk down the street. With this study, because they had asked me they had many more subjects than we had in our chambers, they couldn't do bronchoscopies. So instead they did something which is known as induced sputum. You sort of like spray a hypotonic saline. It causes you to cough up a big blob of mucus. You can do a lot with mucus when you get out of the lungs. So, leave it. <laughs> so what they've done here is they've looked at something which will tell them whether the upper airways are inflamed. And they've measured a compound called myeloproxidase. Now, myeloproxidase is contained in granules and neutrophils. And when neutrophils are angry and killing tissue, they release myeloproxidase. So if you see an increase in myeloproxidase, it means the neutrophils are there, and they're activated, and they're causing harm. What you can see here is if you take all of the asthmatics, high park voices up the street, you can see they have upper airway inflammation. Walking down the street with high diesel in the middle of the world. So inflammation is occurring. And this inflammation is really the basis of the health effects we see from people who are exposed to air pollution. And if you think about the long-term effects, it's because you have recurrent cycles of inflammation occurring every day, which then result in structural changes, sensitization of the areas, and premature aging of tissues. The other thing I wanted to make was that some people would say these studies are fine. But we're really talking about microenvironments. When we talk about the epidemiological studies, they're usually using models or they're relating health effects to pollution concentrations measured at background sites in the city. And pollutant concentrations of traffic fall off quite quickly from the road. So this is just to illustrate here we have a hypothetical busy road. This is the concentration of NO2, concentration of fine particles, the concentration of ultrafine particles. And what it says is, as you move away from the road, very rapidly these concentrations fall. So, within 50 metres you can see it's falling. Within 100 metres, we can see we still have elevated concentrations. And when we do, when we present work about London to Americans, they say, well, that's fine. Who lives within 100 metres of a busy road? Mm -hmm. And so we show them this. And we say, these are the postcodes of the entire Hamlet only which are within 100 metres of a busy road. And in America, there are restrictions on whether you can build within 500 metres of a busy road. Nobody in this particular picture of Tower Hamlets or Hackney lives less than 500 metres away from a busy road. So all of these people are exposed to that brown soup. They are all exposed to high levels of pollution. And the reason I've highlighted this is because I've done lots of work and talked about it very briefly in Tower Hamlets, but sometimes you think, well, who lives there? How many people live there? Well, here we are, this is just coming out of the Blackmore Tunnel here, going around this roundabout where we've seen some of the highest concentrations we've ever measured in personal monitoring, and there's a whacking great big estate. So lots of people are exposed at these locations, and it's slap bang on the roundabout. And as you go up the road towards the Olympic site, you can see all the new builds they've put on some of the most polluted roads in London despite the fact that we know what the associations are. So lots of people live within these microenvironments. I can only tell you briefly, we've done some studies in this area. So we go into schools, and we've been doing this for four years now. Now this began as a study to investigate whether the LEZ was going to improve children's health, which is rather compromised when the mayor cancelled the stage of the LEZ that we were going to study. So it's now been extended two more years after January of this year. But we go to schools, and we have all these dots at different schools in Tower Hamlets and Hackney, and if you know the areas, you'll see that, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of these schools are slap bang on some of the busiest roads in London. I mean, really, right on them. Um, you wouldn't, and I often think you wouldn't get permission to build the schools there now, and then I come across a school where somebody has built a new school slap bang on a busy road, so that rather destroys it. We go in, we go into the schools, we do lung function testing on the children. This, we look at the gases they breathe out, because some of those will tell us whether they have inflammation in the airways. We take swabs to get DNA from them, because we want to know whether they have subtle variations in their genes, which may make them more or less sensitive. And we take urine from them to see whether we can measure 
market the information or oxidative stress. We do a whole lot of information in these studies, and we are trying to link that to their actual exposures to PM10, PM2.5, and O2. Now, I can't tell you the data because it's all being worked, but I will say we are already seeing in the first four years of the study evidence that children who live in the polluted, more polluted areas have lower lung function. So there is an evidence of an effect within this area. And I, for a while while I was doing this, thought we might not see the type of results they'd seen in the American studies, because of all our children have exposures which are at the very far end of the American exposures in their study. They have a much wider range of exposures to their children. All our children have high exposures. So, you know, it's, it, it's difficult to see that sort of gradient. Okay. But this work is ongoing, so that we can see what happens when NEZ phase three and four have, have, have begun to manifest. So hopefully we'll see something like that. We are doing baseline analysis of this right at this time. The other thing I wanted to illustrate is we've been doing lots and lots of work trying to understand what children are actually exposed to in the real world. And so what we've been doing is actually walking their routes to school. So what we do is we go to the school, we find out where their home postcode is, the school, then we then use GIS to calculate the routes they work, get them to confirm that they walk those routes, and then when we do these school visits, me and a colleague usually turn up about 5.30 in the morning and we walk all these routes. And this is just an illustration of the sort of data we can get. This is a machine which measures particle number concentration, which people think is increasingly important in terms of the cardiovascular effects of heart attack. And we can also measure this little blue box, black carbon. And what I have here is just an illustrative set of data from a visit we did at the John Cass School, which is located slap bang in the Vorgate roundabout. So some of the highest concentrations we've measured of pollution in schools were at that site. And you can see we've done three routes. We can see we have this route here, which looks relatively low. You see peaks are lower. And this one, which is higher. This, is, this little dip here is walking up Rick Lane at about 7.30 in the morning, very little traffic. This huge exposure on this route is as you swing down into Wacom. And we've collected a huge amount of data uh, over the last year, mapping out these school routes and looking at the exposures to the children, which again, we're in the position of analysing. So I can't show you any real data, but I can tell you we've, we've certainly walked about 300 kilometres of school walks and collected more data on personal exposure than anybody else in the world currently holds. So it's going to be an incredibly useful data set to understand how real exposures relate to effects which are measured acutely in these children. The other thing which I've been thinking about has arisen because of the amendment to our... We have, a, we have a, an iPhone or an Android phone app, which has just been updated. And it's just been updated, so instead of giving you this old format of telling you these are the sites and these are the levels of pollutant, it now will give you a surface of London hour by hour, which will tell you what the concentrations are as a surface. So you can see where the high concentration levels are. And this, because of our work with school children, made us think, could we use this now cast prediction to actually find alternative routes to move through the city to see if we can reduce our exposure to pollution? Because I can tell you the LEZ is going to have very little improvements on, on air quality. What would be the benefit of actually having informed usage of our city in terms of providing people with or maybe even pedestrianised routes through the city so they could reduce their exposure. So using Nowcast, we actually did uh, a little quick study where we just basically, well, I made a Dutch student walk from where I am based in Franklin Wilkins building and I made him walk to the British Library and back a lot of times. Right? The reason it's in the British Library is because they have a nice coffee shop. So, you know, I'm not completely mean to the student. <laughs> so we made him walk a route which now has predicted as being high consistently in all the days we did this, and we made him take an alternative route which was showing low pollution on Nowcast. Now, we thought, how much exposure will you save? What's the benefit of using this device to alter the way you move around the city? And this is very preliminary, but here we're just looking at black carbon. And effectively, we could reduce the individual's exposure to black carbon by 50% simply by changing the way they moved around the city which is feeding into our idea that we may go to schools next year and get children to think about alternative routes that they can walk to school. Although it has to be said, having walked some of these routes, sometimes there is no alternative to them walking along a busy road. But nevertheless, I thought that this was an interesting 
system. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't regulate, we should just say, get on with it, and the city stays the same, and people should just be careful where they walk around the city. But I think providing people with short-term evidence like this, that they can reduce their exposures, whilst we deal with the policy issues, which are going to take a long time to turn the situation around, is actually a very useful thing to do. So we've quantified this for a lot of different endpoints now. We always see a considerable benefit. And I have a summary. The summary is sort of self-evident, really. Um, if you're exposed to PM for long periods of time, it will impact on your cardiovascular system. Your system will degrade. I like the idea of talking about premature aging. People who smoke know their skin prematurely ages. People who are exposed to sunlight know their skin prematurely ages. Getting across to people that if you live in a condition of high pollution or you smoke, you have accelerated aging of your lung. I think it's a message which helps to tie in with the fact that people then are dying prematurely. Um, you shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the acute episodes still will kill people, acutely, who are already sensitised. So it's not just this long-term shortening of life, there are real critical acute effects as well which are happening within the population. If you reduce PM, I cut this line out, you can see measurable effects. People went back to those six cities in the States and looked at what happened after the particle concentrations went down. And they showed that as the pollution fell in those cities, so did the mortality rate. So you, if you can effectively reduce pollution, you can improve mortality rate. But more importantly, you can improve the quality of life of people with diseases and the quality of life of the general population. Again, thinking beyond just the headline mortality figure. Studies in experimental chambers, or with people working in the real world, actually support the health effects that the epidemiologists see. So this isn't some strange sort of science out there which people can question. There's real hard science of real toxic effects happening in the lung which support it. So that means that this is not soft science, this is robustly hard science. Um, and then finally, you can actually reduce your exposure if you're supplied with the right level of information. But it's not an alternative to actually meeting your regulatory targets. About, uh, during October, there was a fantastic email exchange which happened um, on one of our Twitter feeds. And I remember it because it was a really interesting one. And essentially, there was a pollution episode and so the government had put out some advice that people should maybe not go out and ride their bikes or do too much exercise outside. To which we all thought, well, that makes sense. And somebody wrote in and they said, why is the advice that I shouldn't go out and run my bike? Why isn't the advice that you shouldn't take your car out? Surely the advice should be, don't take your car out so that people who are living a healthy lifestyle and using the city actually can use the city. And it was an important issue. So I don't want to present this as being an alternative. It's an adduct to deal with the fact that the changes we want to see aren't going to happen. Thank you very much. Brilliant.